I'd like to welcome all of you who have joined us today for a StorageCraft webinar, a training session on our new file-based backup product. It's a new technology that we've recently brought into the fold. We're happy to have the opportunity to share why we did this and what exactly it means for you, uh, for new revenue streams, and for business. On the call today, we've got uh, myself, uh, Rob Walton. I'm the Product Marketing Manager for our off-prem products uh, at StorageCraft. Uh, my email address is there. Any of you who have questions as we go along, uh, pay attention to that and uh, let me know. Our instructor today will be Sean Matthey, one of our, our skilled uh, and tenured uh, professional services uh, people here at StorageCraft, and we're happy to have him. We also have Scott Holowinski, who is one of the founders of uh, Gilware, uh, one of the original uh, key players in the development of this product, which is many generations in now and which we will be talking about today. Scott will be working with us to answer questions as we go along and at the end. For your information, this uh, webinar is being recorded. A link to this recording will be sent out to you uh, afterwards. As we go along, please ask questions that come to mind using the question box at the lower right-hand side of your screen. Uh, as I mentioned, we'll answer these as we can as we go along and get to as many, if not all of them, at the end as we drop into Q&A as well. So thank you very much for being here, and I'd now like to turn it over to Sean Matthey uh, for our instruction today. Thank you very much, Rob, and thank you everyone for attending our webinar today. So let's take a look at our agenda, and once again, we are really excited um, to announce to all of our partners this new product and technology that we've acquired. Um, and it's our, we're, we're, it's our data analytics file-based backup. So what we'll be talking about is just taking a quick view of the market and how we address different storage um, problems and the messaging and the solutions to that. We'll jump into data analytics. What is it? And how does it apply, especially with this, this product that we have? Where does it fit? How do we sell it? Um, hope to give you a, a, a quick demonstration of its capabilities and what we can do with it. And then final, finally, we'll, we'll wrap up with uh, some questions um, as they come in. Now, we do, if you look on the uh, go to webinar piece, if you have any questions throughout the, the webinar, if you go ahead and, and ask them via the, the, the questions mechanism, um, in that tool, we'll be able to respond to those questions throughout the webinar. So we're really looking at a storage explosion, and we've been seeing this for, for several years. Um, and what we're looking at today, we're at the beginning of a revolution, a storage management revolution. We're very, very pleased that StorageCraft is leading the way. Typically, with this storage explosion that we've been encountering over the last several years, um, the storage industry solution to that is just to add more storage. Um, disk certainly has become um, quite much more economical um, in order to just to apply additional storage. But one of the problems that we see is that by adding just more storage, regardless of what it is, it's not just the disk that we're paying for. It's, it's also, you know, it's the, it's the units, it's the sands, it's the power that goes in, it's the labor, it's, it's, it's the cooling for our data centers to be able to do that. And so just to, to go along with the storage industry and just, just to say, yep, we just need more storage, more storage, more storage, isn't necessarily, it's treating the symptom, it's not going after the problem. And all of this notion uh, all of this issue is around the notion that, that we have that not all data is equal. And when we, when we talk about that, you know, it's, it's the comparison of, for instance, on our, on our own desktops and laptops of having these temporary internet files or, or these caches or temp folders or all of, all of that, we're treating that as equal as our critical data that runs our businesses. And so StorageCraft, really, we're, we're leading the way and really 
trying to be counter to say, listen, not all data is equal. And as we talk with the different analysts about this message and we discuss with them all the different market trends and how we are approaching this type of this type of um, way of to address the storage of not of treating it data as important versus not important they've been very excited and they've given us really positive positive uh, feedback regarding that so when we look at the storage craft mess messaging and we look at what we're doing lately storage craft um, we won the best of VM world the 2016 gold award uh, we've received top CRN innovation honors we in this next piece is really really impressive we have doubled our product development workforce we are continually adding new technology both internally developed as well as acquisitions just like what we're talking about today with the acquisition of Gilware software we are really approaching real problems and we're we're offering solutions to those real problems for end users who are really overwhelmed by data um, once again we are a channel company we are focused in on the channel without you our partner there is no way that we can succeed so if you don't succeed we're not going to succeed so we are focused on on being being part of the channel to be committed to the channel and, and really to put together the tool set and the product set to allow you to succeed, which in turn um, really will, will help us grow rapidly. So when we look at our recovery solution, and this is the, the, the tried and true if, for you folks that have been around with StorageCraft over the years, um, this is really kind of our solution set, the whole, the whole recovery solution, the whole recovery solution platform. And when we look at how this storage craft data analytic file-based backup fits in it, it's really just an extension to our already powerful recovery solution. Because everything starts at really a good, solid backup. We have the ability to manage that backup, to replicate it off-site, whether it's to your data center, the customer's data center, or to our cloud. We, it facilitates the recovery, both physical recovery, virtual recovery, or the recovery in our cloud. And so when we look at the addition of this data analytic file-based backup, we're really looking at the ability to, to complement and actually add further reach on data protection. And that's really what we're going to be talking about today. So when we look at that, we are looking at it through the lens of that not all data is equal. Um, we acquired the this file and folder based backup from Gilware, not, not for file and folder based backup, but we've acquired it for the data analytics. And I'll talk about this more in just a few minutes, but this really circles around the crown jewel of this product, which is the backup analyzer. It gives you a web-based interface for centralized installation, deployment, configuration, monitoring, and reporting. And this product, and this, this technology was built from a solution provider, from Gilware, a solution provider, for the use of solution providers. And one of the things that this gives you is the ability to easily manage thousands of devices, easily. It does provide significant advantages to protect and recover critical remote computer data. We'll go in through that um, a little bit more. So, the key piece of this is the backup analyzer, and that backup analyzer gives intelligent data analysis. It lets us know what is currently on the system, what is currently being marked for backup, what isn't, what's excluded from backup, and it also gives an offering of what we can do in order to um, maybe it would make it makes suggestions on what we should include as part of the backup. It gives the partners, the, the tools leveraging technology to choose the protection level for each data type and offering. And it gives faster recovery of the most critical data, you know, minimizing the recovery time objective. I, I, was, I travel most weeks, and a few weeks ago, I was headed down to New Orleans for work, and I was working on the plane, and I had internet access. And as I was kind of going along, 
I was using a file kind of like a template. It was for one of my professional services engagements, but it was kind of a, a very similar type of project that I was working on, but it was different. And so I'd use this, this file that I was uh, uh, just kind of adapted that I'd already done for a different engagement, but I screwed up. I made a mistake. And what had happened is that instead of you know, making a complete separate copy, doing a save as in Word, um, I'd forgotten to do that, and I'd made a whole bunch of changes, and I just clicked the Save button. So I overwrote the original one. I was like, oh, no. But because I was running this, this product, because I was running this, this uh, data analytic file and folder-based backup, on the plane, I was within 30 seconds, I was able to do a self-serve recovery and restore it from the cloud, which was terrific. And it allowed me then to get, get back the original. I, you know, of course, then I renamed it and was able to, to continue to go on. And as I said just a couple minutes ago, this product and this solution scales to allow the management of thousands of computers from a single point. There are folks that would say that they're competitors in this space. The, the problem is it's a one-to-one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one -to -one relationship, and it makes it very costly in order not only just for setup, but for the overall management of that. And, and we'll, we'll kind of go through some of, these, um, some of these scenarios a little bit later. So the problems with, with recovery, um, you know, the main thing that I've encountered over the past six years that I've been with StorageCraft is how do we address critical data with the mobile workforce? How do we do that? And um, I, over the years, I've had partners, StorageCraft partners come to me and say, okay, well, I've got mobile workforce. How can we, how can we capture that data? And, and I've actually answered in a very clunky way about, you know, maybe put Shadow Protect Desktop and drop a second you know, hard drive in, which sometimes isn't always possible, but then you need to, you know, replicate it out and stuff. But, but it's, it, it's really, was really more of a, of a clunky um, type of scenario. Um, along with that, and, and part of that problem is the need sometimes for backup without having a local repository somewhere, like a, like a NAS or a, a BDR or something that's there. And then also over the years, and I, and I, um, in my past, I was a, an IT director for a, for a high school, and I constantly, you know, the, the direction that I would give the faculty and staff is, you know, save to the network drives. Save all your data there because I back that up. You know, make sure that you do that. However, users, being users, and sometimes, sometimes they forget and sometimes they don't know the difference, but they save sometimes wherever they save. And a lot of times it's to their desktop. Sometimes it's to, uh, you know, they create a folder on the, on the root of the system drive or, or something. So data is being saved in different locations. And we don't necessarily know that until all of a sudden I re-image the machine or if uh, maybe the hard drive crashes and I put a new hard drive and, and, and then I, and I restore it. And then the user says, okay, where is my data? And I say, um, on the server. And they say, well, I look there, but I don't see anything. And so we, we have this notion sometimes that data is saved in different locations than what we prefer. And sometimes that data is very critical, and we want to make sure that we capture that. And then peer-to-peer -peer networks, you know, the serverless organization, the small organization where they have, maybe they have a NAS appliance, maybe they've got just a peer-to-peer -peer network with, you know, four or five uh, workstations, and they're sharing um, folders and files between them. Um, we've had kind of sometimes a kind of a clunky way of being able to 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 back those up in a nice, pristine way. And then finally, or not finally, the second to last, servers and workstations with static and or archived information. Maybe we don't need system recovery. You know, we know with StorageCraft we have robust system recovery with with Shadow Protect and Shadow Protect SBX where we can you know, resurrect an entire system. But perhaps we have servers or workstations that have a lot of archive data that doesn't change a lot. And that, that static data, we want to make sure we capture it, but we don't necessarily need that quick system restore. And then finally, we're in an era with companies exploring the BYOD, the bring your own device. 
So they might give an allowance for an employee to, to purchase their own you know, laptop or desktop, right? The employee owns that, but then they use it for work. Now, how, as an IT professional, how do I make sure that I am backing up my business data off of an employee's own device without backing up their pictures of their kids or their pets or their videos or anything else that they do, right? So one of the, the, the challenges of managing data is this BYOD. And I'm really pleased to, to tell you or to inform you that we now have an answer to all of these different types of challenges. And the challenge is the data analytic file-based backup. And once again, it's not just your, you know, as we would, as the commercials say, this is not your father, your father's Oldsmobile, right? This is not your file-based backup. So it's not just file-based backup, but what it does is it allows us through the through the use of the backup analyzer to intelligently look at all the all the data that's on a particular machine, and then we can make decisions without interrupting a general business process with that user. We can do this all offline and be able to make some really intelligent and smart decisions on what we do. So the data analytics file-based backup does three things. It identifies, it tracks, and it protects. Once again, this backup analyzer, and, and this is really the key takeaway with this, it, it detects, it reports all the files on the system. So it, it, is, it is basically enumerating everything that's on that particular device, where they're located, what is being backed up, what's being excluded, and it, it reviews and it will, will prompt you, it will make suggestions and say, hey, I don't know how to treat this particular file, or perhaps you should include this within your backup. So what that allows you to do, and all of this is done offline, so you no longer do you have the, the days of you telling your, your end user um, business employee to say, hey, okay, I've got this installed now, we need to schedule an hour or an hour and a half for me to go through and choose what we need to back up or not back up. We don't need to do that anymore. And we'll, we'll get into everything that, that goes into that process a little bit later, but part of this is really centered around the backup analyzer because what it's doing is it will enumerate into the portal, into the dashboard, everything that, that we're looking at, and then you can make some smart decisions on there. We allow, in, un, under the identity piece, we're allowing for alerting for changed documents or, or, or folders. So, so perhaps you have a, a machine that you're, you're really not backing up other than maybe there's a routine where it's pushing you know, a, a zip file, a backup file to your file server, right? And so you, you've got that. Well, you know, once you have that file and it's been pushed over and it's maybe it's doing it nightly, right? It gets backed up once, but what happens if that routine gets interrupted somehow and it's broken? Well, you know, in, in normal file and folder based systems, you wouldn't know that until you went to go restore it and then you'd realize, oh, this is old data. But what we can do is we can watch those files, we can watch those folders, and we can say, listen, this file or folder should change every two days. And if it doesn't change every two days, then you get alerted for that. And that is, is, is just, a, just a glimpse, just a scratching the surface of the power of what the data analytics file-based backup can do. Beyond that, we're tracking. Uh, the rule-enabled policies gather the data, and as agents check in, we will receive and apply policies universally. At the very beginning, the very first time, we'll back up the entire file, the whole, the whole enchilada, the whole file itself. Now, as that file changes, the next time we will back up, we're only going to, we're going to detect and only back up at the block level of the change from the disk, the block level of the disk that's changed. So when you look at, for instance, if I create a, a, um, a a PowerPoint that's that's really a lot of there's a lot of multimedia in it and you know it's just packed and let's say this PowerPoint is is a, a 30 meg file so this 30 meg file I realize that 
you know, Scott Holinsky, who's on the call right now, uh, I realize after I've saved it and it's after it's backed up the first time, I, I realize I spelled Scott's last name wrong. And I, oh, man, you know, I know Scott. I like Scott. I don't want to, I certainly don't want to show any disrespect to Scott. So, of course, I go in and I make that change. And, and it's just a, you know, a quick change. Maybe I just did a typo and I reversed the, the a couple letters. Well, the next time that that backup occurs, we're only going to back up the blocks that have changed for that file, not the entire file. Many of our competitors or the competitors that would say that they're competitors in this space, they'll mark that whole file that needs to be backed up again. And once again, that goes back to that notion of how the storage industry is approaching storage. Oh, just just add storage to it. You know, if you're if you have to back up the whole file, that has an impact on what how much data is being stored offsite at in in the wet in the on in the cloud, right? It also has an impact on on bandwidth in order to to send that file to the cloud. But by backing up only the block level changes, then of course we're also compressing really utilizes both the cloud storage and it also utilizes the bandwidth much more efficiently. And then in protection, the selected critical data is moved to the cloud storage location. And once there, we are actually employing a lot of metadata in each of those, those pieces and it allows us to give multiple redundancy checks to make sure that the, the data is safe and able to be able to recover it. So when we look at how this might fit into our implementation within the storage craft recovery solution, um, on the left-hand side, certainly the mobile user, the tablet user, the laptop user, they need data protection. And this file-based backup, it is, it, it's an excellent candidate for the, the data analytic file-based backup. Likewise, on the right-hand side, when we look at servers, these servers often need full system recovery. And because they need full system recovery, they're an excellent Shadow Protect SVX candidate. And then when we look at the middle, the laptops and the workstation, they might need one or the other, or perhaps they could utilize both products on there for both be able to do system recovery as well as being able to recover you know, individual you know, critical data as, as we need to, to, to recover them. When we look at um, the folks that would claim to be in this space, you know, and here's a, a list of, of, uh, of several, of course, it's, it's not exhaustive list, uh, exhaustive list. Um, we would argue that really because of the data analytics portion that we have here, where we're able to leverage the technology to do the heavy lifting, um, we we are we are leaps and bounds ahead of any of these of these products because the superior intelligent design and the ability to manage thousands of devices from one dashboard gives really the the solution provider the leverage to be able to be intelligent and smart how they approach backup and recovery. And when we look at this, um, we're kind of looking at this from, from a standpoint of, you know, Scott, I've heard Scott talk about, um, it's, it's almost like hiring an additional virtual technician to work for you, or more virtual technicians, it might not just be one, it might be several, without ever having to pay them a salary. Because what we're doing is we're leveraging the technology and what's capable with the technology in order to manage everything a lot more easier. So the offering is available now in North America. You can access this through the new partner portal. Um, and when you, when you go ahead and you get into that, um, you'll see actually the partner portal, everything is located there now. Um, and under the, the, the basically the cloud services, you'll see the, the file and folder base backup. It is a subscription offering. You will, the first time that you go in there, you'll have to accept the, the new cloud services agreement. Um, it's actually a three clouds in one agreement because it, it can, handles the current storage craft cloud services. 
it handles this product, which is data analytics file-based product, as well as the upcoming cloud-to-cloud -cloud, um, product that we'll be releasing shortly. Right now, our operating system support is Windows only, um, and we have no support for XP Vista 2003 or Windows Core products. Um, one thing I will want to mention, too, is that not only are we leveraging the data analytics, and that's really, once again, that um, backup analyzer is the crown jewel of this product. We are also leveraging other technologies, as I mentioned, backing up you know, the subsequent backups being at the block level, plus we're leveraging VSS. And because we're leveraging VSS, we are able to back up any open files that are there. When we talk about billing, the search will begin to accrue after the first full calendar month following the acceptance of the agreement. So, so the, let me kind of explain what, what this is. So it, the service fees, we're basically giving you a full month without, without charging you. So for instance, um, today is, um, and I've, I've actually forgot what day it is today, but, uh, but let's say you, you go ahead and you install this at a customer site on November 2nd. You'll have all of, all of the rest of November, and then the first full month is actually December, and once again, we haven't, we haven't started charging or accruing charges. And then January is when we'll start accruing the service fees, and in February, you'll receive your first bill for January's usage, if that makes sense. So if it's not a full month, we'll give you that rest of the month. We'll give you the very first full month that's there, and then and then we always build in the arrears. So it, after that first full month of of accruing fees, then we'll we'll charge you that next one. Just like our uh, cloud services, we'll bill you only on the machines that are in use and the storage that is used on the last day of the billing cycle, which is the last day of the month. And then as a storage craft partner the storage will be pooled across the account, right? And it will be rounded up to the nearest gig. So, so it won't be to each customer, it will be pooled across the entire um, solution provider account that, that we have. So when we look at um, the, the pricing for the, the partner pricing, um, you know, it's based on the devices that we're, that we're doing. And once again, that's pooled across the entire partner account. We'll give 100 gig per machine, um, 100 gig per device, you know, for desktops, and once again, that will be pulled across the account. So if you had, for instance, seven devices, seven desktops that are out there, you would be charged seven dollars per month for those seven. So that would be forty-nine dollars, and for that, those seven machines, they would be able to be combined, even though they might be across a couple different customers, they, you would be able to use um, 700 gig of data that's there, um, which is actually pretty terrific. So getting access to it uh, with the client experience, it's, it's only via the partner portal. And so you would log into the partner portal, and I'll show you how that goes in just a minute. And once you do there the first time that you'll need to do, you'll need to accept the uh, partner agreement if you haven't done so already. And then on the left-hand side, you'll see the managed service providers, and then we'll, we'll see the, the listing that says file-based backup. The first time that, we're, that you're going in and, and doing that, it will, it'll keep your same login, but we'll auto-generate a password, and then we would, we would suggest that you, you change that password the first time that you get in there. And here is an example of the dashboard view. So, so when we look at that, um, that is something that, that we're um, that you're able to manage, and all of your work that you'll be doing will be from from the dashboard that's that's here. Okay, so let me go ahead and give you a, a demonstration. Oops, I went to the forum instead of our website. So we'll go ahead and we'll log in as you would log in um, into the partner portal.
Well, you got to love the live demo. Oh, here we go. All right, perfect. So I've logged in. I'll go ahead and expand the Manage Services piece, and I'll click on the file-based backup. And what it does is it brings me to the dashboard. And this is what you would see as, as, a, as a solution provider, as a partner. So I do have one account. The backup status, um, it's, right now it's zero of one, but it, it, uh, part of that is it, it said that it was okay because I want to make sure that I have a, a complete backup at least once a week that's here. And so now you'll see you know, Sean's laptop. And if I go ahead and click on Sean's laptop, it'll load all the information that's there. And, and typically speaking, um, this is probably pretty average as far as the data that's being backed up. I've got just, just under 30 gig. We, we're seeing um, that the average user probably occupies between 30 and 50 gig um, per, per workstation. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and run the backup analyzer. And what the backup analyzer is going to do is it's going to go ahead and bring up um, and load up you know, basically like an, an audit file that will be able to, to roll through and, and see um, what's being backed up and what's not being backed up. And basically this was this is part of the agent that is installed on the on the device itself. And the agent once it's installed, it will, you know, it does do some light communication, you know, back to to the cloud. Um, I'm getting a good GUI there, so I'm just getting that restarted over again here. There we go. All right, we are in the process of getting everything loaded up. So now we've got some specific boxes that are here. So this is the files that are, are marked for backup, and it and it tells tells me here um, that everything you know actually is going pretty well, right? Um, I've got six files that haven't backed up yet, but 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 you know certainly that's okay. Now I want to show you real quick the suggested and the unaddressed files, and so when we look at the this, I'm going to go ahead and click on that to highlight it. Now I can go ahead and scroll down. Now I'm I'm colorblind, so I don't. Don't actually, I can't identify what color this is, but this is shaded. So these are the different types of pieces that they're saying, hey, this is right now, um, they're either unaddressed or I need to be able to, I want to be able to su suggest the files, you know, specifically for the backup. So when I look down this, I see, oh, here is something, this is about actually one of our, our cloud services data centers, um, and it's not being backed up, and I want to make sure that I back that up. So very easily what I can do is I can click, click the plus sign, and what it will do is it will dynamically create a rule. Now this rule can be applied just to this computer, or I can apply it to, a, to a, the standard configuration. I'll talk about the standard configuration in just a moment. So what it allows us to do then is I'm able to very quickly say, yes, I want to make sure that I, I back that, that file or um, that extension up. In fact, I could, I think this is a zip file, I could convert this to an extension rule to say, you know what, let's back up every single zip file that's there. Um, and if I wanted to apply it to the standard configuration, I could, or I could just go to this, this particular computer. Um, and then it's really just that easy to be able to, to periodically review your, your customers and make sure that you are backing up what you need to be backed up. Now, Part of the, the, the problem with other types of file and folder backups is often they use templates. And a template is really something that is static information. Yeah, we can take a copy of something that's already existing, and it gives us a little bit of a head start, but that, that template actually is static information. Once we make changes with it, 
in order to make any other changes back, we've got to go into every single uh, template that's there and, and alter it a little bit. What we have here is something that we uh, tout the standard, like the standard configuration. The configuration is a living and breathing, um, basically a living, breathing organism, if you will. And what it allows us to do, and I'm going to go ahead and, and choose the, the view, um, is it gives us the ability to constantly manage just hundreds or thousands of devices from one configuration. And so when we go in and take a look at the, the edit the figure configuration, you're going to see um, like rule sets. And I'll, and I'll talk about the, um, some of these backup subject to exclude in just a second. But when we look at the rule set, one of the rule sets that you'll see is like anything that starts with an STC, this is a rule set that StorageCraft is, is, is putting out there. Now, you could choose not to use that. But what we're actually doing is we're making the, the, the job a lot easier for you to get up and running. So within that, for instance, if I go to this common user data and I choose edit on this STC rule set, you'll see different items like that, all right, we're, we're grabbing things from the My Documents, we're, we're grabbing things from, from the um, from the desktop and, and, and so forth. And we can do this both on rules to include as well as rules to exclude. And that will be that is fairly fairly critical as we look at at how we're how we're doing that. So when we look at the backup subject to excludes, what this means is that we always want to back up these type of files um, that are there. And they're subject to exclude because you may have some things to exclude from backup. And when we take a peek at this, we're looking at items that we don't really necessarily care about. So going back to that notion, not all data is equal, right? And let's say we choose to, to include all the, uh, we, we have something that's, that's subject to excludes. We want to back up any docx type of a file. Well, that's great, but what about those files that are in, like, the um, Firefox cache, you know, the temporary cache that, that the browser does? So it's it just downloaded a, just, a, just a temporary copy that's there. Well, we might not want to be able to, to we might not want to, to actually include that in our backup. So that's where the master exclude thing that, that is there allows us. And you'll see some of it, it's app data, it's temporary internet files. It's you know Firefox files, it's Chrome files, etc. Then we have backup always, and that will anything that any rule. This is actually will will end up taking taking the place. This is takes top priority. So if I say backup always, any files that match that rule will always be backed up. No exclusion list would would necessarily apply. So what this does is this gives us this configuration, this living and breathing document, as well as our, the storage craft rule sets that get you started, then you can continue to make other rule sets that are more modular to be able to address your, the computers that are there. And typically, a solution provider may have maybe a small handful of configurations. Some, some just have one which is terrific, and a small handful of conf configurations that they might use for their own implementation. The, the advantage of having this configuration to be this living and breathing document means, let's, let's say I'm a solution provider, and I have you know, 3,500 devices that I'm managing throughout my whole customer base. And all of a sudden, there is a... Um, Let's, let's say that I'm typically in an in a insurance vertical. And within this insurance vertical, there is a new application that applies just to the insurance vertical. And that application has an extension of .efg, right? And so we want to make sure that we're, we're able to, to match that. Well, I can go ahead and I can create a a rule set then 
that will say, hey, I want to make sure that I back up any file that has an extension EFG. And as soon as I make that rule set and I save it, it then applies to all 3,500 devices. Or actually, maybe not all devices, but any device that's looking to that particular configuration. And so from just one entry that takes me 10 minutes or less to do, I have now have edited the, the jobs for the backup across all the devices that are looking to that configuration. That is the power of this product. That is the power of being able to leverage the technology in order to do what, what we need to be able to do. There's one other thing I, I'd like to show you, and then what I'd like to do is, is, is turn it over for questions um, with, with Scott, is I had, had talked about earlier a, uh, the monitor items the, that we can set on, on the watch file. So we can look at these different types of monitor items, and I've got, I've got two of them in here right now. I've got an Excel spreadsheet, actually two Excel spreadsheets, one that's called London and the other one is called Scratch Pad. And I'm, and I'm actually saying, hey, you know what? These should change. We should see an expected change you know, at least every day. But when we go ahead and we look at um, at being able to to uh, to set these monitored items up, it's actually very very easy. So I'm going to go ahead and rerun the backup analyzer real quick. And we're as we're loading the backup file now, I'm going to go ahead and choose the files that are marked for backup. And if I come down to look at that, then I am looking at really all the files that are currently being backed up. So when we, when we go ahead and we look at that, we say, all right, you know what? Um, this polls.pdf, and it's a, just a PDF. Actually, let's do the, the roster down here on the XLS. If I wanted to monitor that, I can just go ahead and click on the I to create a monitoring rule. It's going to be for this computer only, for this rule name. And I say, you know what? I want this to be this, this should change within every seven days. So there should be a change to it. And if it doesn't change, if it doesn't get backed up within every seven days, which means that there wasn't a change, then it will alert me. I click Save, and then you'll see that the, the rule set is saved. And then we, we are really on our way. So then when I come back and I look at that particular account again, and I look at the view monitor items, you'll see that that roster is now a, um, a watched item. So we're able to, to monitor those. And if they don't change, um, they'll be able to do that. So with that, what I'd like to do is turn it over um, maybe to Scott, who has been um, very busy, it looks like, as I look at the questions of, of answering the questions. And he'll probably go through a couple of the, of the common questions, if you will, and, and if there's any that, that still need to be answered. But I'll go ahead and take it away, Scott. All right, thank you very much, Sean. Um, yeah, there's been a couple of common questions, so I can kind of uh, cover those right out of the gate. Uh, one, uh, we've gotten it a few times, is a question about whether or not there's the option to keep a copy uh, of the backed up data locally um, as well as in the cloud. As of right now, the cl this solution is a cloud-only solution. Um, if you have implementations or applications where they are requiring um, extremely fast failover or um, you know local um, storage of the backups. Um, the Shadow Protect product is is really still the correct product um, in those situations. Um, another common question um, has been about um, how the scans operate uh, for the backups. Um, this is not a continuous backup situation, at least not right now. Although we have talked about making it more of a continuous backup solution um, in future releases. But as of right now, the backups occur according to a scan schedule. Um, as by default, the solution will run a backup scan once a day. Um, you can set that more frequent if you would like. And that is part of the configuration. Sean did not show it, but part of that standard configuration um, is the ability to actually set up the scan schedules. Um, and again, you can do all of that from the, the web portal. You don't have to call up the customer and schedule a time to remote onto their computer to make changes like when the scans run, um, how often they run, and of course to mark and unmark um, 
files for backup. Um, there's been a couple questions about VSS um, and if open file backup is possible. Um, we use uh, VSS absolutely, um, so open files uh, and lock files can be backed up, um, so absolutely. Um, we had a couple questions about um, what OS's this runs on. As Sean mentioned, it's a Windows only product today. Um, we certainly do intend to have a Mac client in the future. Don't have any kind of specific release date on that yet. Um, but, but any post uh, Vista Windows product, including servers, it will work for. I will say that when it comes to server backup, you know, pay very close attention to the specific application. Um, you know, we, we still want to make sure that if, if it's something where it's a complicated configuration, a lot of data, remember this is a cloud-only solution. Um, so if we're talking about a terabyte of data uh, and complex configurations, um, you know, recovery time is going to be slow um, as you download this data and get that server set back up. So pay attention to what the application is what kind of recovery time objectives um, your client has and pick the correct solution that fits those needs. Um, all right, let me just look here. There's been a lot of great questions and I've answered many, but I want to uh, actually read them to make sure nobody missed them. Um, oh, we've gotten a lot of questions about um, can you roll this out and have it running in your own cloud if you have your own data center or own storage? As of right now, it all runs on StorageCraft's cloud. Um, this has been a, a pretty common question, um, and, and I think that the, the intention is uh, in the not-too-distant future to pa package it up where you could run it on your own private cloud. But as of right now, the product is cloud only, and, and it runs in StorageCraft's cloud only. All right, so yeah, good question. So since this is a cloud-based product, um, requires an agent to have the internet. Um, so if a laptop is taken out of the office, will it still back up with internet connection? So yeah, this is really designed for folks on the road, um, working from home. Um, as long as there is an internet connection, the, the backups will happen. Uh, so as Sean mentioned, if you're connecting to the internet while you're flying on your plane, if you've made changes to the files since the last backup, it will backup while you're flying on the plane. Um, so it doesn't matter where that internet connection is coming from, the backups will happen. Uh, if you shut the computer down in the middle of a backup, um, it will resume that backup when that computer comes back up, on, comes back up online. Um, so it's, it's pretty robust from a scan perspective. Um, as I said, the scans run by default once a day, um, but you can set that to whatever uh, frequency you would like. All right. Um, there's been a couple questions about revisioning and retention. Um, so, so you can set to keep as many revisions of a file as you would like. By default, it keeps, um, I believe it's about a thousand uh, revisions. In all reality, most files are not changed a thousand times. Um, but you can set those um, based on policies on how many revisions uh, that you would, you would like to keep. But yeah, that's completely configurable. All right, let me just see if there's any others that I have answered that I want to make sure that we cover. Um, there's been a, a couple questions about resources during the scans. As Sean mentioned, um, the, the scans, um, after the initial, what we call kind of the initial seed backup, where you get the complete copies of every file that's being backed up, backed up. Um, after that, it's differential, so you're only backing up the small changes that occurred. So, uh, for example, on my computer, which is a very typical business laptop, I'm backing up probably 25 or 30 gigabytes of primarily Word documents, Excel spreadsheets, Quicken, QuickBooks, things like that. Uh, my scan typically takes less than a minute to run um, because, again, it's only backing up those small changes. So. Uh, it's already very lightweight in terms of the resources that it requires, but it also is, is even better because the, the scans run so quickly once that initial scan is done. So most users are not even going to notice um, that that scan runs. Uh, it does it very, very quickly and it moves on. There, there's a couple of questions about uh, alerts and reports. Could you just 
chat about those for just a second, Scott? Yeah, both are extremely important, obviously. So there are um, alerts that go out to the, the, the partner um, when there's issues. So the, the reports are based on really two factors. Either um, you can set a threshold for how long it can be since the last complete backup, which we, we, we say a last complete backup is when is the last time that every single file that is marked for backup. Um, the most recent revision was backed up. And yeah, Sean, if you go, before you go to the end user report, Sean, maybe just go to the account overview quick for your backup. Uh, one note here, just for those of you, when you log in and you do your first purchase, you will get an NFR of the product uh, that's Perfect. available Thanks. to your organization. So. Yeah, Sean, go into your laptop there like you, you just were. Click on your Sean's laptop. So yeah, there's, there's two factors that go into whether or not an alert, an email alert will get sent out. On the left-hand side, there's that last complete backup. So you can see right now, Sean set a threshold of seven days. Um, and as long as it's been seven days or less since every file on that computer marker backup was backed up, this will remain green. Uh, if this went to eight days since a complete backup, let's say Sean goes on vacation, his computer is not turned on, um, the partner will get an email alert. The other thing that will fire off an email alert um, is that monitored item feature that Sean mentioned on the right hand side. So Sean's right now is in red, probably because he just has some random files monitored right now, but um, this would be firing off an alert um, to the partner saying, hey, one of these monitored items or multiple monitored items, we haven't gotten new revisions of these files for some reason. Um, this feature, uh, Sean did a great job of, of explaining um, what it is, but just to give a tiny bit more background into to why it's here, um, for anybody who's not familiar with Gilware, um, we actually started as a, a data recovery lab, um, recovering data um, that was lost for a variety of reasons, and that's still a big part of what we do at Gilware. Um, and one of the most common reasons that a the customer ends up in our data recovery lab isn't because they don't have a backup solution. In fact, more than half of our customers who come to us for recovery have backup in place. But one reason they end up here is because, let's say a backup script was set to run and it runs every night and that file then gets backed up um, by a different system. And all of a sudden the guy who set that script up leaves or quits or gets fired. And nobody knew that his user account was the one running that backup script. Well, for most backup solutions, all we know is that, yeah, the most recent revision that I know about of that file is backed up, so everything sounds and looks good. The problem is, is that file is no longer changing. It used to change every single day, and uh, again, I have the most recent copy I know about backed up, but it hasn't changed in two years. Um, again, we see this all of the time. Well, with a monitored item, it's, it's essentially a way to keep a pulse on a file. Um, you can say that, hey, I expect that small database to be changing every day, and I expect to get a new copy of it every day. If I don't, I want to know about it. Or let's say it's a QuickBooks file, really, really common. I expect to get a new revision of that QuickBooks file once a week. I know that that owner of that business changes and updates his QuickBooks once a week. Setting a simple monitor is a really great way to keep a pulse on a file or a folder. Um, and again, figure out and, and avoid those types of situations that end up in our, our data recovery lab. You know, we don't suggest that you go through and set a monitor for, you know, 30 files on every computer you're, you're backing up with this solution. But it might be the business owner, it might be the accountant who, again, is handling their QuickBooks. You know, pick those couple very, very important um, files or databases and monitor them. The other thing the monitors do, Sean, if you want to go to the end user report, um, uh, and again, the original question was alerts and reports. Um, so we have alerts for partners, but end user reporting um, is also really, really important. We fully understand that one of an MSP's biggest challenges is continually showing the value they're bringing um, to that customer. Um, so what we have here is end user reports and that logo needs to change. I'll get on West to get that changed. Um, but what you're looking at here is what a report might look like for one of your end users. It rolls up all computers being backed up for that customer. Um, so if it's a small business that has you know, 10 file based backups on, they'll see a report here that'll have all 10 of them. Uh, at the top it has just an overview, um, but at the bottom it has a detailed view for each computer 
And not only does it say how much data and how many files, but it actually will show you the status of those monitored items. So from a value proposition standpoint for your customers, they're not just getting a generic report from you once a week or once a month or every day. They're getting one that shows them important, specific important files that they know if they lost, it would be bad news. It, it'll show them that, oh yeah, Sean's backing up my QuickBooks file or that small database that's my entire CRM, he's backing that up. So the monitor items are not only a nice feature to, to kind of let the partner sleep at night, but it's also a great way to, to customize the end user reports. Um, and you can schedule these reports, you can generate them on demand like Sean just did, or you can schedule them to send out to as many end users as you would like, and you can select at what interval that that happens. So Scott, um, we have time for one more question. For those of you who have questions that you've asked that we haven't had a chance to cover, we will send you a one-on-one -on -one response to make sure all of your questions get answered. Again, this is recording. Uh, we will send the link out to you as well for your further review. So uh, if we've got time for one more question, Scott, and then yeah. we can uh, turn the time back over to their productive selling and servicing. <laughs> Yeah, so there's a question about, um, you know, I think what they're getting at is with the full image product, you can do a, a seed drive or, or do an initial backup to an external drive and then ship it in. Um, is that same feature available for uh, the file-based product? And it is not. This is really intended to be a cloud-based solution for primarily laptops or, or small servers or desktops. Um, like I said, typically speaking, an average user will have about 30 gigabytes of data they're backing up and we'll, we'll do that initial push via the web and we'll restore data via the web. So if you have situations with lots of data that require seed backup or restores that will require you know, transferring to an external drive because it's lots of data, uh, in those situations the, the correct product is, is still the Shadow Protect product where all of those services are still offered. Thanks, Scott. Thank you, Sean. And thanks to all of you who have attended today. We appreciate all the great questions, your interest. Uh, you are StorageCraft. And so we're, we're very grateful for the time and attention you spend to our uh, solutions. And we look forward to uh, getting together with you soon to talk about other things that are going on. And uh, have a good day. <laughs>